Hey, good morning, everyone. It's Tractor Man 44 here. Hey, you know what we're going to do today? We're going to take a, um, a light duty tractor with a light duty loader and we're going to build a set of light duty forks for it. This is a Kubota B3030. I think it's a 2005 model, maybe. Uh, it's got an LA403. And if I remember right, the 403 stands for kilograms. And one of my uh, one of my viewers on another video let me know 403 kilograms equal out to roughly 850, 875 pounds. So, like I said, light duty. It's nothing like the the regular back hose or skid load or anything like that, but it is big enough to do a lot of work. I'm not gonna go overkill and build it out of big heavy material. I'm probably just gonna use reinforced uh, two inch channel iron. And if it does bow them, if it does bend them, you know what we'll do? We'll just use this as a prototype, come back and build a heavier set. But for now, I've got the material, doesn't cost anything. We're gonna build these in one of many ways in which you can do them. If I take an arbitrary dimension here, roughly six inches in from the outside edge, and mark that up here in front, right off the edge of the bucket. Go ahead and mark me six inches up here and go ahead and latch this channel iron here to the bottom of the bucket. Put a thin spacer under here to compensate for the cutting edge, making sure that the forks will be on plane or level with the bottom of the cutting edge. Then I'm ready to figure out what to attach back out here. Now I would put them out here on the outside edge. That'll make it much stronger because you got the reinforcement of this here, but for two reasons. Number one, the lift capacity is not that great, so whatever little bit of pressure I'm going to be putting inside here is not going to matter. And secondly, the farther to the outside edge of the bucket, the longer the pieces have to be to carry on the forks. So by moving them in just that little bit, that's going to give me 12 inches of narrower material that I can haul without fear of it falling down. So here's another piece of scrap. What I was going to do is flip that up here like this. Then we got to get this angle right here. So. Uh, instead of trying to do any fancy calculation, we just get a piece of scrap iron, any old piece of scrap iron, and we just lay it right here on the surface of this guy right here. Make sure that runs up nice and flush to the back of the bucket. And there's an angle right there. If I cut that angle, then we've got the angle to, to, to weld right to this right here. Okay, so here's this outside piece right here. It's prepared. We got the angles and everything cut on it. Got holes drilled in the middle right here. And that's going to be to go through the surface of the bucket and to make sure that all the pressure is not just on that thin material of the bucket. I went ahead and preemptively made a piece of uh, scrap half inch plate that's going to go half inch flat iron. That's going to go inside the bucket and sandwich the entire depth of that bucket, transferring all that stress and everything to a much larger area instead of just on two bolt heads. You know, I tell you all the time, when you're making something, you're always changing your mind, you know, about different parts of the project. And digging around and coming up with some pieces, you know, to make the attachment clips, I come across several pieces of the perfect size half-inch flat iron that I decided to go ahead and reinforce the top of this, make it a little bit stronger. So that's what we're going to do now. Then we'll go back to the original plan. I'll put grade 8 bolts in here. And in here on the front of the bucket, remember, I was going to put this half inch plate. I got a 3 8 grade 8 bolt. And if I accidentally break those 3 8 bolts, we'll always go to a half inch. That's going to minimize flex and any extreme pressure to that j s small area that the actual bolts go through. That's going to spread that all out, all that twist and torque on the bucket. Now we got to address the front attachment up here and make a two inch by two inch square. I'm going to set this right on top of it. I'm going to drill a hole right down through the center here, right down through the center of both of these half inch plate thicknesses, weld this plug onto here, and then tap that for three quarter inch thread, five eighths or three quarter inch thread, and then squish this down with a grade eight, a five eighths or three quarter inch grade eight bolt. A little too much heat. Well, we're back to the monstrously old drill press. Came out of an automobile factory here in, in St. Louis. It's got the, the Morse Taper 3 MT3 chuck. What I'm going to do is I'm going to be drilling a, a 21 32nd hole for a 3 quarter inch number 10 or 10 threads per inch grade 8 bolt.
there's a specific drill size for the different taps. I chose 21 30 seconds because uh, 5 eighths is 20 30 seconds and I thought that would be too small. It was going to be putting too much force on the, the three quarter inch tap and I thought 11 16 wasn't going to give near enough for a wrinkle to do any amount of holding or the maximum amount of holding and so because this is going to be on essentially a forklift lifting heavy stuff I thought I'd go with 21 30 seconds which gives us that extra extra little bit of meat on the threads for the uh, three-quarter tin to hang on to. Now I started cutting those threads with the standard the standard handle and that three-quarter inch and it's an old tap too you know it's not in the best of shape so I give up on that and went and got the big guns this old boy here is you can get the torque on it. Matter of fact, I just punched through the bottom right there. So I can go back to put this little guy on it right here and clean up the threads fairly easily. But I'm using a, a thread cutting oil called Tap Magic. Tap Magic is really good for drilling holes, drill press or by hand or whatever, or uh, drilling and tapping threads like this right here. To kind of clean those up a little bit, especially with an old, old tools like I've got, you can just run them in and out a number of times. Now if we're lucky, this ought to thread right in there. Three quarter inch grade eight bolt. The weakest thing on this is my weld joints. Okay guys, now hey, let's, uh, let's have a little bit of shop time. You heard that bit start squealing? When that bit starts squealing, or any bit starts squealing, it's not doing its job. Chances are it's going to need touching up. And that's a telltale sign that there's something happened to the very edge of the, of, of the cutting edge. And if you look at this, hopefully you can draw in on this, but you can see right here, for whatever reason, I've got a little bit of a burn spot right there and right there on the outside edge. So what's happening is that's what's making the squeal right there because now the cutting edge doesn't come all the way over to the flute. The flute is what grabs the spiral and shoots the spiral shavings and stuff out. So here's the cutting edge from here. It's got to go all the way out past or to the edge of that flute and it's no longer there. When they start squealing, you may as well stop because all you're gonna do is burn up your bit. So I'm gonna go ahead and sharpen this, touch it up, and we'll go back to business. Hey, let's go back to shop class again. If y'all ever at a yard sale and you see a funny looking thing that looks like this right here, with all kinds of numbers and stuff on all kinds of angles. What this is, this is specifically a 59 degree gauge to uh, sharpen the angle for your drill bit. Uh, drill bits are, the typical shop drill bit is made to, uh, to be ground at 118 degree included angle. I think included angle means you add this 59 together with this 59 and it totals 118 degrees. Now there's all kinds of fancier uh, grinds and stuff nowadays on bits, but this typical old shop bit is 118 degree included angle. So uh, now we're getting really, really close to getting out to the outside edge of the flute. So I think it's going to, uh, it's, it's going to go ahead and work just a little bit better. But one thing that you have to make sure is that all the metal of the drill bit behind the cutting edge is lower than the cutting edge. So whenever you run this into your grinding wheel and sharpen it, you have to drop the back end of it down so that you re relieve the back end or the back angle off of that cutting edge so that the whole bit isn't just rolling or just sliding around on the metal, uh, keeping the cutting edge from doing its work. The cutting edge is what does the work. The flute is what gets, up, gets rid of it. That's not looking too bad. I'm going to put it back in there and just touch it once and see if it's going to, uh, see if it's going to, I'm just not going to go any farther. Sorry, did not mean to get sidetracked, but you know, this is a good time to, to point out something that uh, you might keep your eye open for uh, at, a, at a yard sale. Remember, 118 degrees included angle. Hey, the good thing about these uh, taper chuck, number three taper chuck, all you have to do is line this flat spot right here up with the hole and slide it in and friction does the rest. It may fall out until you put a little pressure on it the first time. But once you put pressure on it, it should be just fine. So I'm going to pull this in here. Get me centered up on the hole again. 
give me a little fresh uh, cutting oil in there. See what happens. You can see the ribbons coming out. We're drilling through one and one eighth inches of steel. Like I tell you guys all the time, when you use old equipment, old materials, old drill bits, old tools, old everything, even tractors most, most of the time, you have to be willing to, uh, to make concessions. Now, if you wonder why my drill bit was stopping every now and then, on my drill presses, every one of my drill presses, I like to run the belts loose because when the drill bit catches, I just assume the belt slip as to catch a piece of metal and flip it around and catch me in the back of the hand. So I run my drill, all my drill presses with a loose belt. Uh, that way you have to, you're forced to kind of go slow. You can crowd them a little bit once they start sticking back off a little bit like that, but that's just what I do. Uh, probably ain't recommended, but you know, it is what it is. When you're tapping big holes like this, you don't just grab this thing and go around and around and force it. Especially a coarse thread like this. This thing has taken one heck of a lot of material out, so you have to break it backwards and break off that curl a little bit. That lessens the stress on the tap tremendously. Plenty of cutting fluid too. Now you don't have to be this careful with the 5 16 or 3 8 3 quarters, 7 8 or 1 inch, you'll be glad to have a T-handle this size. Three quarter ten. All right, there it is, quick and simple. Uh, we got a set of light duty forks now. I'm not going to put the angle on underneath for stiffener because I really think that this half inch plate across the top is increasing capacity where it's going to uh, to go beyond what the lift will lift. But it doesn't matter if it if they bend. I'll just do something different. Uh, if you have not noticed in other videos, you will notice as soon as I start using this for its intended purpose that my bucket is twisted. Uh, I knew it was going. It was twisted whenever I started this project. I just have not had time to take the bucket off, weld it down to a bench, cut some slots in it, and bend it back, twist it back, and then weld it and bra brace it in the manner in which we'll hold it perfectly square. You're going to notice really, really quick whenever we raise this up that by the time you extend this out 25 and a half inches or so, this side of the bucket is curving down pretty far. But that'll get taken care of whenever I fix the bucket. That's another story for another day. But that just goes to show you how quick and easy you can do this. But I got the reinforcements up in here. I got them marked left side and right side. It's very, very solid, very secure. I've already got up on and stood on them. Uh, I can bounce around on it. And there's a little bit of flex, but not much at all. So um, I'm thinking it's going to be pretty good. But it always amazes me the tools that you need to get a little job like this done. You know, obviously you need a number of C clamps. This soapstone, you got to have a, a battery drill with a, a drill index, a couple of drills, of course, pair <laughs> gloves, you know, because the metal gets hot. And I use the impactor a little bit, got a square, uh, inch and eighth, end wrench for tightening these down. Of course, you need nuts and washers and all that stuff. You need a uh, folding rule, you need a tape measure, you need a bandsaw, you need a grinder, welding hood, uh, the whole bit, you know. It never ceases to amaze me the just sheer number of tools that you have to have in order to do a simple, silly little project. But at any rate, I cannot wait to get out there and put a little weight on this and see what uh, what's going to happen. And the only thing I really got left to do to this without putting the angle iron reinforcement underneath is I'm going to angle these back. I've got to take my cutting wheel and cut these back at an angle to where they're sharp instead of having that channel gouging right straight down in the dirt. I apologize for the shop tutorial about sharpening the drill bit there in the middle of everything. But that seemed to be something that was absolutely positively necessary. When it went to squalling, I knew that that thing was damaged on the end, and it was going to have all it was going to do was just ruin the bit. And like I said in there in the shop, when you use old tools, old equipment, like I do, you have to learn, learn simple maintenance techniques, you know, to make those things function as good as you can, you know, to keep from having to spend big bucks on new equipment. This has been a quick, simple, and fun one, and this is Tractor Man 44, and I am out of here, guys. <laughs>